a night out of fun and bar hopping would end in a horrific tragedy. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Emet St. Gian. Viewer discretion is advised. Emet Carmela St. Gian was born on March 2nd, 1981, and she was born in Boston, Massachusetts. Emet grew up in a very loving family. Uh, she was very close with her dad and would just become the best of friends with her sister. From a very early age, they could tell that Emet was going to be something special in her life. She was very, very intelligent from a very, very early age. She was described as being very uh, radiant, very energetic, full of life. She was the type of person who would always think of other people before herself. She was someone who wanted to make sure that if you know you were having a bad day or you were something was wrong, uh, she would try to make you feel better or try to help you if she could. Her intelligence uh, would just continue to grow and she would graduate high school and then she wanted to work in the legal world. So she would become a student of criminal justice and she had aspirations to fix the legal system or I guess you should say the, the jail system um, to make life easier for inmates or to improve how inmates live within a prison. She would end up graduating uh, magna cum laude from George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And at the time of the story, she was attending the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City. And she was literally two months away from getting her master's degree. And her master's was in criminal justice. But unfortunately, that day would never come for her. It was a cold February 24th, 2006 night. Emet, who was 24 years old at this time, uh, was out with her friend Claire. Apparently, Emet and Claire were friends all the way dating back from high school. They were really close. So that night, the two friends went to uh, a bar there in, the, in New York City called the Pioneer Bar. They shared a few drinks, had some laughs, but then eventually, from what it sounds like, the two friends got into an argument. They, they fought over something. And Claire decided she was going to cut the night short and she was going to go home. But Emet said, I'm staying here. And that's exactly what she did. So Claire left and Emet was at the bar, um, technically by herself because no one else was in their, in their group. By the time Claire got home, it was probably 30, 40 minutes after she left the bar and she would call Emet on her cell phone and, you know, ask her, you know, what she was doing and if she was okay. Uh, and Emet said that she had actually left the Pioneer Bar and now she was over at The Falls, another bar there in the city. Emet was just about to turn 25. Her birthday was right around the corner and so she wanted to stay out and have fun and so she was basically bar hopping, even if, she was, even if she was doing it by herself. But when Claire hung up the phone and ended the call, that was the last time she would ever hear Emet's voice ever again. On February 25th, at about eight-ish or so at night, police would receive an anonymous call from someone who was at some diner. And this caller stated that there was what they thought was a body on the side of the road. And I guess this was outside a park known as Spring Creek Park. When police arrive at that scene, uh, in fact, just literally right off the road itself is this like comforter. And when they pull back the comforter, they see a body. It was the body of a fully nude woman. She had plastic ties around her wrists and there were shoelaces that were tying her feet together. She, someone had just kind of crudely stuffed a sock down her throat, and it appeared that someone had cut some of her hair off. Her genitals were also partially mutilated. The coroner would determine that this woman uh, was definitely sexually assaulted. She had been strangled, 
and uh, suffocated. So essentially suffocation was her cause of death. The police would pretty quickly identify the body of that of 24-year-old Emet St. Gian. So police would, uh, basically, they, they needed to find out where she was that night. So they found out through Claire that she, they first were at the Pioneer, the bar, and so police would go there. They would interview the people who worked there. They would interview any patrons they could that may have seen anything from that night. They didn't really get much information from anyone there. Then they found out that Emet had gone to another bar called The Falls, so they go there and they interview the owner of the bar. His name is Daniel Dorian. And from what it sounded like, uh, he was not giving them all the information they felt he knew. He seemed to basically at first recall that I don't remember seeing her, she wasn't here. Uh, but then after another interview, he, he basically changed his story. He Essentially, he claimed that he lied during his first interview because he didn't want the bar to have this bad reputation that a girl who was last seen here there is now m murdered. Um, and so he didn't want that reputation, apparently. But then he changed his tune. He said, yes, Emet was there that night. As a matter of fact, Emet was essentially the very last person in the bar uh, at approximately four or so in the morning. And according to him, she was drunk and being a little, I guess, uh, burdensome. So he asked the bouncer there to escort Emet out of the building and that's what the, the bouncer did. He took her out of the building. Mr. Dorian says that he thinks he heard Emet and the bouncer arguing outside of the bar, but that was basically it for him. Like he didn't see her after that. So now police need to track down this bouncer and his name is Daryl Littlejohn. He said that he escorted Emet out of the building and that she began to walk away, but he didn't see her after a few minutes and he didn't know where she went. And for a little bit, that was it. Great. But here's the thing. On uh, the zip ties that was on Emet, police did find a DNA profile and you know other various pieces of evidence had DNA on them. And so what police did was they looked into Daryl Littlejohn and they realized that he had a criminal history. He had a history of robberies um, and one of those convictions he had to provide his DNA. It was like a mandatory thing. So out of curiosity, they ran his DNA that was already on file against the DNA profile found on the zip ties that were wrapped around Emet's wrists. And lo and behold, it was actually a match. His DNA was on those zip ties. There were witnesses who stated that they, they saw this uh, big van, I guess, driving around the area where Emet's body was eventually found. And so it kind of just stuck out to people. And when police go to Daryl Littlejohn's house, they see parked next to his house, there is this big van. So at the same time police are doing the search, there are like news media there and they're recording all of this. And so when the segment airs on the local news, uh, they show that van on it. And that's when another woman comes forward to say, oh my God, that's the van where I was, that I was kidnapped in. Her name is Shanae Woodard. And in 2005, she was confronted by a man when she was walking home sometime in the late afternoon. It was broad daylight. And this man appeared to be dressed in some kind of police uniform. And it had like some like fugitive team or fugitive trackers or something like written kind of odd on his clothing. But he appeared to her just kind of at a glance to be a police officer. He had handcuffs. He said he was placing her under arrest for unknown reasons. So he handcuffed her behind her back. And then he threw her in the back of this big van, which at that point she's like, okay, this is, 
not what this is this is not a cop <laughs> right and so before he manages to i guess close the doors she manages to jump out of the van and she runs so when shanae comes forward to police this is also put on the news and then another woman comes forward to say that she was involved in another very similar situation a man dressed in some kind of weak attempt at a police uniform accosted her abducted her managed to get her back to a place, a house of some sort. He essentially brought her back to this place, tied her up to the bed. She had like a jacket or a, something placed over her head. And this woman was sexually assaulted um, a couple of times. Then the individual who did this to her basically took alcohol and just ran it through her mouth, essentially to attempt to clean any potential DNA evidence um, from her. Uh, but she was able to get away as well. Now, in both of those cases, those women did not recognize Daryl Littlejohn. They didn't know who he was. He was a total stranger to them. But what police imagined happened, though, with Emet is that Emet did recognize him because she had been to this bar before. She had likely had seen Daryl a couple of times at least. Not only that, she knows where he works. So if he were to have kidnapped her, sexually assaulted her, and let her get away, she would be able to identify him. So that's why police believe that he made a mistake. He should not have done that to a person that would have been able to ID him. And so that's why he likely killed her. But thanks to the DNA evidence, police are pretty confident that Daryl, after being told to escort him met from the bar and probably have seen her as well a couple of times in the past, decided I'm going to take her. And so he probably kidnapped her, put her in his van, drove her back to his home where he would sexually assault her. And then that's where he likely killed her. Put Then put her back in his van and drove her to the location where he eventually dumped her body after wrapping her up in a comforter. But police needed some more evidence um, other than the DNA. They needed to have like a solid case. So they checked his cell phone records. They would uh, be able to trace his movements based on cell towers. So based on the witness statements that when they saw that van near the area where Emet's body was eventually found, they would they would be able to trace his cell phone movements off of a cell tower that basically was next to the dump site and so they knew that daryl was there at the dump site at the approximate time witnesses placed that van there dumping the body and so they know he was there then they were able to trace his movements back to his um, home but they basically created essentially a path they showed his movements based on his cell phone um, data. And that's how they knew where he was at the bar, when she went missing, then back at his place, then at the dump site, then back to his place. They knew his movements. On the comforter that was wrapped around Emmett's body, uh, they found various forms of like fibers, carpet fibers. They found like a fur from like a mink coat. Uh, they found those types of fibers also. And all of the fibers they found on the comforter matched the fibers found inside Daryl Little John's van and also fibers directly from Daryl Little John's home. So they were now you can't say with a with a 100% positive certainty that the fibers are the exact fibers, but they were visually identical. Daryl Little John continue to say he was innocent. He had nothing to do with it. He said the last time he saw her was when she was walking away from the bar after he escorted her out. He he actually tried to blame his boss from the bar, the Falls Bar, Mr. Uh, Daniel Dorian. And he's like, well, didn't he lie to police at first about not seeing Emet? And then he changed his story, which is true. But the fact of the matter is, is they didn't have any physical evidence connecting Daniel to this murder. They had physical evidence connecting Daryl Littlejohn directly to this murder. I mean, the sighting of the van near the dump site where she was eventually dumped. They had his cell phone records basically tracing the exact path of the bar to his house, then from his house to the dump site and the dump site back to his house. They had all of the fibers, which were a, can't say a 100% perfect match, 
but they were identical to fibers found inside his home in his van that were on the comforter that was wrapped around Emet's body. Then they had uh, basically small traces of blood DNA found on the zip ties, DNA that was not Emet's, but was a 100% match to Daryl Littlejohn. It was his DNA, his blood. Daryl apparently had issues with nosebleeds. And while, when they were investigating him, um, when they're interviewing him, he did have some fresh looking scratches on his body, but they also found out he had a nosebleed issue. And so they believe that blood from the zip ties came from possibly a nosebleed. But there is no reason why his blood DNA would be on the zip ties that were literally tied around her wrists. There's no reason for that unless he was the one who did it. There's just no way around it. I mean, he can say he was framed by police because that's, you know, that's an easy, an easy response, which also isn't necessarily out of the question. I mean, it happens, but um, there, there just there was just so much proof, witness statements. Um, the last person that saw Emet was Daryl Littlejohn, and again, the witness sightings of his van and. The other women who came forward to say, oh my God, that's the same man who kidnapped me and threw me in the exact same van. It's all, it was just all so dismatched. <laughs> so Daryl Littlejohn was arrested and charged with the murder of him at St. Gian. I believe they would also eventually charge him, I think for sure, with the kidnapping of Shanae Woodard. And I think he was also convicted of that. But he would go on trial for the murder of Emmett St. Gian, and the jury would take less than a day to come back and say that he was guilty of her murder. And so he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Additionally, he did receive 25 years for the attempted kidnapping, or the kidnapping, I should say, of Shanae Woodard. Daryl Littlejohn will never see the light of day again, and he will never be able to hurt any more women ever again. He met St. Gian was two months away from earning her master's degree in criminal justice. Her goal in life was to work in criminal justice and fight for justice for victims. And sadly, uh, two months before she was awarded that, she herself would become a victim. But thanks to the system she loved so much and fought hard for and aspired to work in, that system was able to get the justice that Emet St. Gian so rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case, true crime, a Rooney Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. Yep, that's a thing, that is a thing. Throw up if you want to. I know it's gross to hear, but that's what you guys are to me. It's, it's, I love it. It's a good thing. It's a positive thing. Anyway, if you have tripped, fallen, and stumbled your way into this video, hi, I'm Mike. I tell true crime stories here, obviously, on YouTube, and then also over on TikTok. So please subscribe to me here and give this video a like. And then um, if you want to, you can follow my TikTok page. It is listed in the link tree in the description of this video below. I tell multiple true crime stories there every single week in shorter form, obviously. So yeah, but that's it. That's it. That's it for the video. It's over. It's done. So I don't know what you're still doing here. Why are you still lingering around here, you creeps? I'm just kidding. I love you. I just had a, a, a heart attack or something. No, no, I didn't. I'm alive. I'm still here. Anyway, I don't know how to end my videos ever. Um, I don't just know how to say, ha ha, goodbye. Every no, not like that. That would be stupid. <laughs> It's not a thing, that's not gonna happen. So anyway, um, bye. <laughs> I don't know how to say goodbye to you, my friends. Don't sing, Mike, it's not your thing. I know it's not my thing, shut up, I know. I talk to myself sometimes anyway. Um... <coughs> uh, bye. Good. Goodbye. Yeah, the dog says bye too.